Welcome, everyone. My name is Paul Roger. I'm very honored to be the facilitator for this discussion. We'll be here for an hour with um, Clara Nichols, professor of agroecology and uh, honorary president of SOCLA, Jahi Chappell, executive director of Food First and author of Beginning to End Hunger, Food and the Environment in uh, Belo Horizonte. And then finally, Peter Rossett, professor of agroecology at Ecosur in Chiapas and reti recently retired staff at the International Secretariat of La Via Campesina. So we're looking forward to a very um, uh, enlightening discussion and we'll be following that with questions from the audience. Um, so I'm pleased to bring, to, uh, offer uh, Clara Nichols the mic. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, and I think the panel is uh, very interesting. So I'm going to talk about agroecology as a science, uh, how they are going to provide the technical strategy for social movements. And I think I want to start with saying that agroecology is a science, it's a holistic study of the agroecosystems that uh, mimic nature. It's very important, and this is the reason why uh, agroecology is a a combination of Western knowledge and traditional knowledge. And the idea is to tailor these uh, strategies to site specific condition of farmers. It's in universal principles, but take technological forms if we are uh, working with different kind of farmers. But the most important thing is the agroecology fills the gap that left by uh, the Green Revolution. Uh, that work with resource poor farmers mainly. It doesn't mean that it cannot be applied in large farmers or entrepreneurial farmers, but agroecology has the focus on working with the small farmers that uh, don't have resources uh, as the Green Revolution proposed. And the other thing that is very important, at least to mention, is that the majority of farmers, uh, small farmers in the world, are the ones who are producing the food they produce 50 to 75 percent of the food that we consume by use 25 to 30 percent of the land and also uh, use 30 percent of the water and 20 percent of the fossil fuel now that we are talking about soil and no oil the peasant agriculture is the one that we have to learn from them because they have been doing this for centuries and the other thing that is very important about agroecology, and I think Peter and Yahi are going to talk about this, is that this is a sign, it's a transformative science. Um, it's not talking just about technical aspects, but also the political strategy to change the industrial food system. And the other thing that is very important, to transform the way how we produce and also who is consuming the food. Because food is not just a human right, but it's very important to know that but we need to transform the food system for everybody. And the challenges that we are facing, and I think mainly social movements are facing right now in the agroecological movement, is that we need to close the gap between the socio-political discourse about food and on, on the agroecological transition. So we need to close that gap between discourse and practice. And also because sometimes the, the sophisticated political analysis on food sovereignty is not always matched with uh, and back with the concrete examples. And this is the reason why I, I prefer to show some examples how we can learn from small farmers and how we can work together with social movements. And there is a, a urgent task for the agroecological movement to do the tra translation of agroecological principles into the practical strategies. So we are writing a lot of books, a lot of papers at the academic uh, sphere, but we need to work directly with farmers, how we translate that in practices uh, in order to enhance not only the production, but the resilience. If we are talking about the climate change scenario that many farmers are facing. We need to talk about resiliency. And also the idea how we are going to disseminate all these practices, because I think probably Peter is going to talk about the scaling up agroecology, 
how millions of farmers can use agroecology as a strategy. And for that reason, I just wanted to mention that agroecology is a, is a dialogue of wisdom between Western sciences and traditional farmers' knowledge. Um, agroecology is a science that was born in Latin America. It's very important also to recognize the, uh, the identity of agroecology, but this agroecology work with principles that take a specific technological form that can be applied anywhere according to what kind of farmers we are working with, but it's very important the participatory research that farmers in, the, uh, in their own farms. And these are the principles. I don't want to go into each of the, of the principles of agroecology because probably in the morning you uh, saw other talks that were emphasizing some of these principles, but it's very important to have recycling, favorable soil condition, mini minimize the resources losses, uh, enhance um, species diversity and genetic diversity at the farm level, but also at the landscape level, enhance biological interaction and synergism. Um, the idea is to have an agriculture of ecological processes, but we cannot forget that agriculture is the modification of, no of nature by humans, by society. So for that reason, agroecology is very into the social processes. And for that reason, we have this panel on agroecology as a global movement. And in order to scale up agroecology, um, the idea is to allow all these successful agroecological initiatives to grow beyond an isolated place. We need local experiences that scale up at the level of the region or the territories. And the strategies, probably Peter is going to talk a little bit about, about this, but I think it's very important to um, um, enhance the local strategies, initiatives, the creation of agroecological lighthouses, what experiences are very successful and why, to understand why are so important. Um, reviving traditional system is another strategy, and also reconfiguring the whole territories as a, with uh, agroecological management. And I wanted to give you some examples how farmers are doing this in Latin America. So the first one is restoring traditional system, and this is just one example from Peru, in Cajamarca. This is a restored terraces in Cajamarca, Peru, done by NGOs and a small farmers' organization, communities. In 10 years, more than 550,000 uh, trees were planted, and about 850 hectares of terraces uh, were um, rebuilt, and they also um, 173 he uh, hectares of drain drainage of infiltration canals were restored by farmers, and at the end, the, the result were 11,000 uh, hectares of restored terraces, uh, benefiting thousands of families, in this case, 1247. Uh, and the potato yields and the oca yield went from five to eight, and from three to eight tons. If you compare that with the Green Revolution, the, the results are very high compared with the Green Revolution that probably increased the yield in one or two tons more than farmers are producing. This is another example from Cusco, Peru, is the restoration of, of the, uh, of the guaruguaros in, in Puno areas that now in a scenario of climate change is so important. It's a, a traditional agriculture of, we are talking here about 11, yeah, 3,400 meters above sea level. So the problem that they are going to face are frost, but the canal, the water in the canal absorbs the heat during the day, releases at night, and farmers can produce uh, crops in the middle of frost. So this is uh, one thing that is very important to learn from traditional knowledge that can pass this information to other farmers that probably don't have this knowledge. And the yield impact of water water, you can see here the, potato, the potato yield went from eight to 14 tons per hectare per year. That I think is very impressive compared with the average potato yields in Puno that were from one to four tons per year. And also the quinoa and, and the other crops were similar results. And another example that we cannot forget is Cuba. Cuba is a very good example for, for Latin America and is how this opportunity of crisis helped the, the all Latin America to learn what the Cubans were doing in the times of crisis. You can see here uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the imports of 
petroleum fertilizer and pesticide drop dramatically, but they have a lot of uh, knowledge. They have only 2% of the population of Latin America, but 12% of the scientists. So all this human capital went to redesign their farms and try to do that kind of transformation of the agricultural uh, system in, in Cuba. And you can see here the percentage contribution of peasant agriculture to the national production in various crops. You can see here before the special period and after the special period, how the contribution of small farmers to the food sovereignty were very high. And using agroecological strategies like polyculture, animal integration, rotation, green manure, and organic amendment. And this is one example that we always show this example because it's one of the farms that is like a lighthouse in Cuba. Uh, the, is the, the family of uh, Casimiro, where they, this is how they arrive here, and you can see before and after, and also the reference tree that showed, but it's very important to see this analysis that Lady, uh, the daughter, did the PhD on agroecology, and she has this information. 10 hectares they have. Uh, this is the amount of protein that they can feed per kilogram per hectare per year. But the most important thing is the amount of people that they can fed with, pro with protein, 34, and the energy efficient is 30. It means that they put one kilocalorie of energy and take 30 back, so they are very efficient. And this is uh, from the uh, latest thesis of agroecology. You can see here the phase one when they arrived. This was the, um, the amount of input, the, the dependency on inputs that they have when they were conventional. And then once they did the transition, you can see how the dependency on uh, inputs from outside dropped dramatically and the production remains more or less uh, stable. I think this is very important. And the other thing is how we can mobilize the in innovation that many farmers are doing. Uh, we as a scientist, we are always looking for solutions, but sometimes the solutions are in the field. We need to see and help other farmers to understand what is the solution that they have. And this is one example from Costa Rica. You can see here how farmers try to uh, look for different strategies, how they can hide the, the, uh, the cross from pests. And you can see this is tomato with cilantro because one of the major problems in Costa Rica is white flights. And the way the farmers explained to us is that they were looking for many plants to hide the, the, the tomato. And he found out that the cilantro was very good. And you can see here how the, 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 the cilantro hide the tomato because the cilantro had different odors, but also they have different colors. So the white fly or the insect in general, they just seek the crop using different clues, like olfactory clues or visual clues. So here, the tomato is ready, and they are going to harvest the cilantro, and it's one innovation that is very important to understand, at least for us. I'm an entomologist by training, and I think it's very important. This is the farm that we need to state to know why this farm doesn't have pests, rather than just look for the solution, because we think that in the laboratory we are going to have the solution for white flight, and sometimes it's very too, um, uh, it's very important to understand that farmers are innovators all the time. And this is another example from Brazil. Um, this is how the farmers are using um, with control without herbicides. They don't use herbicides. So here is a cocktail of cover crops. They use nine different species of cover crops. And what they are doing is um, they are uh, using this instrument. It's called the roll of faca. It's a trunk that they just smoke the, the cover crop and they, they have you know, animal traction and then they plant the crops. You can see here the corn and beans and you cannot see the, the weeds. Why? Because this mulch that they were planting with the cover crops have a allelopathic effect. And most of the seeds are in these five centimeters of allelopathic zone. So what they are doing, or they did, is they planted the crop deeper. Because they say they were, it was very hot. This is their, their explanation about how the system work. And for us, uh, that we did several theses with students, we understood what kind of plant have the allelopathic effect. And we can use other allelopathic plants in another uh, farms, but the idea how farmers innovate to overcome the problem that they have. And building resiliency, I think, is the most important, or one of the most important aspects that in the last five years I have been working on resilience to climate change. And uh, I'm going to show several examples. Cl 
we have here climatic event, and the idea is to work on agroecosystem resiliency. And in many, we, we work in eight countries, 20 scientists from different um, countries. We work on, uh, look for the resilience experience in Latin America, and we observe that all of these examples that I'm going to show, and there are mo many more, are, uh, they have uh, interesting characteristics like vegetational diversity, all of them, landscape matrix, and soil and water management. And there are several strategies how you conserve soil and water. Landscape is very important because it influences the local cycles of water. And uh, vegetational diversity is so important in, in the, the design that you are using, like agroforestry system or polyculture, but genetic diversity is one of the major barrels that farmers, uh, the, the major strategy that farmers are using in different um, regions in Latin America. Some of them because they have droughts, others because they have a lot of water or a lot of uh, different conditions. So the first evidence, I want to show the example of, of the work by Eric Hall Jimenez in, in Honduras, in Central America, mainly in three countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Probably you remember the Huracan Mitch, that most of the farmers that were following the Green Revolution suffer because the mudslides compared with the agroecological farms that they suffer but not that much and they recover faster than these farms. And the, the agroecological farmers were using several um, uh, strategies, agroecological strategies like mulch, uh, barriers, terraces, and you can see here how the, the different countries suffer in agroecological farms compared with conventional farms. Even these ones suffer, but they recover faster. So this is the concept of resilience. Have the ability to recover and, um, and learn from the lessons that they have. In terms of hurricanes, we have now a project with Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Haiti. And, and we observe that Cuba have a high resiliency than the other islands in the Caribbean. And this is one example of what happened with Cuba with Huracan Hike. And you can see here, after Hurricane Hike, many farmers suffered, okay? More or less 70% of the damage. But the farms that were more diversified, like in this, in this picture, suffered less, or they recovered fast. And this is another example from my country, from Colombia, with uh, grasses, uh, grasses that were introduced with the Green Revolution. They were very good if you have water and you have fertilizer, but this is what happened when the droughts come. And we have like 300,000 animals that died because they didn't have uh, any grass. And however, there are several uh, farmers that are following the, agro the agro agrological principles uh, using silvopastoral system. And this is the farm that you can, you can see here, an agroecological farm using silvopastoral system that have less evapotranspiration and uh, higher uh, uh, humidity in this condition compared with a neighbor farm that just had pasture. We are talking about two to three degrees higher in the, in the, in the uh, north part of Colombia. That we are talking about the average temperature is 35 degrees. And what happened when they have this stress, you can see this is a farm that have silvopastoral system and you can see this is the phenomenon del Niño less precipitation, or the La Nina, high precipitation in the case of Colombia. And you can see here the production of, of milk was totally co uh, it was constant, despite the fact of the effects of climate change. So this is what we need, design the farm to be more resilient to different climatic events that are going to come. And the other thing that is very important is how we are going to spread this knowledge. We cannot um, continue with the a traditional uh, extension program because we are not going to cover thousands of millions of farmers. So one way to do it is spreading the knowledge through Campesino Campesino. That is a, is a grassroots movement that uh, the main actors are the farmers, the successful farmers that are going to teach other farmers how uh, they are the protagonists of the, of the movement. And probably Peter is going to talk more about that because he has a lot of experience not only in Central America but also in Cuba. And this is just one example of how one, one particular strategy in Central America went from, from 10 farmers to probably 40,000 farmers using mokuna that fix nitrogen and increase the production from 400 kilos to 2,000 kilos. I can see five, two minutes, yeah. 
And the last part is how we are going to uh, reconfigure agroecological agro territories. It's how farmers are going to control the territory and they're going to decide that here we are not going to apply pesticides, here we are going to apply agroecological principles. And for that, I just brought the example from the Mixteca. This is in the Mixteca Alta, where Paul did his uh, thesis that is very important, but I just wanted to highlight the restoration ecology that farmers did, planting trees, organizing a community, uh, um, building these uh, irrigation canals, and also bringing new crops, like for example, amaranth, that are more resilient to climate change in this condition. And this is just results from uh, Sedican, more than 1,000 farmers were trained in agroecology, and more than 500 hectares were restored by farmers. And this example also, the restoration ecology from my country, is you can see here in 92, they, they were totally degraded land, and in, this is 2001, 2014, and this is 2016, how farmers build and reforest this part, and now they have a very good result. They have 75% recovery of the forest. Um, the forests were connected, water conservation, more water for more families. But the most important thing, I think, is the food security, food sovereignty that they have, and the cohesion. They decided to stay in the territory and fight for the territory. And the lighthouses, they are very good examples in Chile and also in, in in Cuba, you can see how they started in 2010, and it became a very good lighthouse, demonstrating that it's possible to restore, this it's possible to produce even more than they were producing. And what they, I think Yahi and Peter are going to talk is the militant agriculture, when you, talk, when you work with social movements, because it's a transformative science, they are taking agroecology as a flag of rural development, and why it is so important? Because it's socially activating, it's participatory, economic viable, cultural appropriate, ecologically sound, and provides the principles for food sovereignty. I think this is the reason why social movements are taking agroecology as a flag of rural development. And also because agroecology, they can produce more, they can be a scale up, they can teach other farmers, and they need, it's just legal initiatives like we have in several countries. Unfortunately, now we are having a very difficult time in different countries in Latin America, political issues that doesn't allow to um, enforce this law. And the other thing is that I just wanted to finish with this one because uh, we need to overpass or bypass the food empires. We, what the Van der Plog said, we need to build an autonomous territory with local market. But it's not that easy like this is life. We think that everything is linear and some actors have their own, you know, their own task. No, it's very complicated. This is a very complex, and we need to have all the actors that really engage on what the, the, main, uh, the main knowledge that they have are the same, they are sharing the same goals. It's very important. And with this, I wanted to finish. Thank you very much. Um, and these are things that we know thanks to many of the people we have here that uh, I appreciate not just the knowledge that they've created, people like Clara, Miel, Peter, and I appreciate oh, up and coming agroecologists like Paul and uh, the Black Earth Farms. So I want to talk about just how agroecology comes from all these different directions and that's so, what makes it uh, powerful. That was a, a sort of technical tour de force. That was a, a technical tour de force. Uh, I'm going to focus, as Clara said, um, a bit more on the social movements and actually a, a bit more maybe lighthearted approach. Uh, agroecology as a term um, is about 91 years old, so approaching 100 years. Of course, agroecology as practices, as knowledge goes back thousands of years. Um, and these are things that we know thanks to many of the people we have here that uh, I appreciate not just the knowledge that they've created, people like Clara, Miel, Peter, and I appreciate up and coming agroecologists like Paul and uh, the Black Earth Farms. So I want to talk about just how agroecology comes from all these different directions, and that's what makes it powerful, uh, and what we can do with that. So where, where it's come from and where we can go. So I've been working in this field for about 17 years, and even just in that period, I can see a major change in how agroecology has been approached or how visible it is. And it can feel like it's, it's everywhere now. Um, I mean, 17 years ago, I don't think HuffPost existed, but you wouldn't have seen it in the agriculture in the Guardian 17 years ago either. 
Uh, we have organizations like SOCLA, the Latin American Scientific Society of Agroecology. We have a center I just came from. I used to work at the Center for Agroecology, Water, and Resilience at Coventry University in the UK. We have the Community Agroecology Network, which is a bit more than 17 years old, I think. So we've seen this sort of flourishing in organizations, as well as citations, publications, books, uh, and many, many, many uh, meetings by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, amongst other groups. And this uh, uh, surge in the FAO and in some other areas also means that social movements and uh, allied scholars have had, had to make sure to keep defining and declaring agroecology beyond the technical, technical definition, to make sure that uh, the meetings where I was at some meetings with FAO this summer, and they said, well, we think we're doing agroecology. Is, is it this? Is it that? And, you know, parts of it were, but the thing that, of course, they couldn't get their mind around is if it was real agroecology and food sovereignty, they wouldn't get to decide. That power wouldn't sit in that room. So we have to keep pushing as well, even as we see it being taken up. And, you know, one of the interesting ongoing conversations is important ones is about co-optation. And I think most of us that have had some experience in the FAO process would say that there's uh, some people who maybe are less than genuine in their support of agroecology and others who really maybe are trying to push that, that power relation change. Um, I don't think there's much doubt, though, that some people are less sincere about their embrace of agroecology, even though they might use the term now and even though they might have changed some of their names or been bought by other companies, the fact that they claim to be embracing agroecology or at least the scientific part of it uh, doesn't mean that we have to believe them. But what it does mean, I think that's really exciting, just thinking about what these past 17 years, is that they've moved on to trying to co-opt the term. 17 years ago, when I was starting, I remember them very clearly talking about people in this room and myself and going, well, agroecology, that's not really a real thing. That's some silly people who have some silly ideas. And now they're saying, oh, no, we're also agroecologists. So I think we should take a brief moment uh, and do something that I think on the progressive side we don't do very often, which is congratulate ourselves a little bit by making agroecology to the prominence it is now, we've made it something they want to take, and we have to defend it. There's so much work ahead, but getting it to this state where they want it, I think, is really a, a important uh, hallmark. And indeed, I think that we have uh, things that they want, which is why they're trying to take it. If you look at, uh, for example, this excerpt from Feedstuffs, which is one of the industry magazines uh, around you know, chemicals, fertilizers, industrial agriculture, uh, they had an article a couple years ago that was sort of concerned with the fact that when you poll Americans, they wanted more natural agriculture rather than more technical, more scientific. That was kind of a worry of theirs. Uh, but when you look at, of course, what people say they want, if we think about, uh, well, especially finding ways to prevent adverse environmental impacts. Does it have a pointer? Oh, that's not the pointer. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. Uh, so, uh, finding ways to prevent adver adverse environmental impacts, that's something agroecology certainly speaks to. Claudio presented some of the evidence that would point to that. If we think about an equitable distribution of food throughout the world, agroecology, food sovereignty, and food justice, what my friend Minnie Schneider and I call the, the new three-legged stool, those three together really seek to address this as a fundamental part in terms of also addressing the resources and support farmers have uh, to make their own food as well as people having access to affordable food. So we also then uh, get affordable food for me and my family. That's an important part of food sovereignty, food justice, and agroecology. Profitability of U.S. farmers. I mean, this was only of U.S. citizens. We kind of insular in our concerns. But uh, we know that a lot of this problem of profitability comes from oversupply and the pressures put on farmers. Only a small number of farmers making almost all the money on oversupplying a small number of uh, products which, of course, then talks about the type and quantity of food eaten. We don't have a diversified uh, diet, by and large. We're eating a couple of processed products again and again because it's profitable from a couple of large corporations. So agroecology, we kind of have what they want, and it's going to be hard for industry to handle it. But if we embrace it, we can make our dreams come true, the dreams of everyone except for the corporations. So. And the, the uh, rest of this presentation is going to give a, a lighthearted look at where agroecology has come from and sort of my informal assessment. Um, uh, Peter Ross and Miguel Thierry have a book recently that goes through this much more in depth than formally. And there's been work by um, uh, Alexandra Wessel and Stefan Ballon. So this draws on all of those, but takes my own little uh, approach to it. 
So agroecology, one obvious part of it, of course, is its last name, ecology. And so this is the dry, boring part. You know, ecology as a term is usually uh, traced back to Ernst Haeckel's coining of it in 1866, thinking about the study of the household, so our environment, the household around us, the people sharing our household in terms of other organisms. Uh, agroecology as a term was first recognized to have been used by Basil Benson in 1928. Actually, I think there might have been some more recent things, finding even things farther back, but that's the, one of the earliest references. And so we could think of agroecology simply as the study of interactions or, uh, of organisms and their environments in agriculture, just in that context. Or there's also a lot of agroecologists who work on the effects of agriculture on non-human ecological systems outside of uh, agriculture. So these are two parts of the roots, and certainly these are things that many agroecologists do, the direction many of us have come from. Another very practical part of agroecology's uh, family history would be agronomy. So, of course, agronomy and horticulture as practices go back thousands and thousands of years as fields sort of recognized uh, in the Anglo system of study it's around 17th and 18th century that they're formalized as fields, uh, the management of agriculture and cultivation of gardens. And so agroecology has this grandparent as well, and so you could think of it as the application of ecological science to inform agricultural practice, so improving resource use, productivity, pest management, many of the things that Clara addressed as well. Also, there's a focus in many agronomic traditions, of course, on what works for farmers and why and where. So in terms of the kind of labor in terms of uh, the kind of risk, resilience, uh, the kind of living they're able to make from it, their relationship with other people in their communities. These are all things that could arguably be part of agronomy and certainly are part of agroecology when done correctly. And then we come to my, my favorite part of the family tree that I think is really under-recognized uh, in terms of a lot of people who, you could say, started out in the industrial system the past 200 years and through their science, you could argue, thought better of it and said, well, this is, this is a really bad idea. A lot of modern scientists who've moved in this direction, and I'd say there's far fewer who've moved in the other direction. So the history of industrial systems, if you want to think about enclosures in England and, and English high farming is one of the uh, high points of the conversion to modern agriculture, industrial agriculture. Uh, Justus von Liebig, uh, who coined what's called the law of the minimum, the idea that a plant will grow according to the nutrient it has the least supply of, I learned about that in a bunch of science classes, in chemistry, in, in uh, uh, basic uh, uh, soil science, things like that, but you don't hear about, at least I didn't hear about, also that he turned against the law of the minimum later in his career. He thought actually, well, when we think about how high farming, about this modern industrial farming, it's just theft. It's robbery. He said that the you know, Americans are committing high robbery and the English are doing it more subtly, but it's, it's robbery of the resources, of the nutrients from the countryside to the cities, of uh, rich countries from poor countries. If you think about, we've explicitly fought wars over islands of guano. You know, it's, it's robbery, and this was part of uh, Liebig's analysis that we don't hear about in our chemistry class, even though it's the exact same dude. Uh, and also, uh, Karl Marx found, uh, declared himself a big fan of Liebig, and he was trying to always catch up with Liebig's writing, uh, partly because of these insights. And then we also have uh, organic agriculture, and I would say, if we're thinking about the history of agroecology, we have to include organic agriculture. You know, the words are different, there's different contentions about what they mean, but certainly people who identify themselves as organic agriculture pioneers are people who are also some of the forefathers and foremothers of agroecology. So you have people like uh, Sir Howard, Eve Balfour, Rudolf Steiner, J.I. Rodeo, a lot of people who had traditional training and then said, wait a second, looking at these other systems, looking at uh, traditional systems, there's a lot here that my science tells me is working really well. And then also we have people who've critiqued the current systems or the industrial systems from a variety of points of view, again from sort of this scientific point of view, but came around to very really radical critiques and alternatives like Rachel Carson, uh, Jose Lutzenberger in uh, Brazil, Masanobu Fukuoka, George Washington Carver, B Booker Watley, a lot of people who have realized from within the system that the system is fundamentally corrupt. And then uh, we have the fourth grandparent as well, agroecology as traditional agriculture. So I've tried to emphasize the term is about 91 years old, but of course the ideas 
the traditional practices go back thousands of years, and an important part of agroecology is not just recognizing the scientific validity that we have come around to of many of these practices, but also honoring and fighting against the marginalization that the people themselves have undergone. And so agroecology in part is about that recognition and celebration of getting that, you know, that emotion, that caring back into the system, as well as recognizing the, the trials and marginalization and occupation extermination that people have gone through. But there's also, in terms of the practices, continue to examine and emphasize traditional systems because um, as the uh, mathematician Nassim uh, Nicholas Talib has said, you know, we, when you see a system that's lasted for a long time, you can, as a first approximation, assume that something is working to make it sustainable, to make it resilient against uh, uh, stressors. And so traditional systems have made it through such a uh, long period of time. There's so much to learn from them. And of course, by and large, they had to be developed to be locally sustainable, to use ecological principles, to be incorporated with local agri uh, landscapes and culture, uh, and to avoid dependence on external, in uh, external inputs. And this, I think it's really important to emphasize, is different than an uncritical call to go back to the old ways. Uh, I think it's easy to lob that ac accusation, but because we have this part of celebration, uh, because people have been so marginalized, and so you have to celebrate, we have to push this space for joy and recovery as well as recognition and, and mourning. But that's not the same thing as just saying everything everyone always did before is good. The people themselves who practice traditional agriculture are still learning and evolving and changing their practices. So it's not about some kind of static prior knowledge. Um, so like I said, so it seeks to learn the best of traditional practices and support and expand them uh, where they can be helpful to people and the environment. So um, agriculture descends from these four grandparents I've laid out. Uh, increasingly recently, it's been uh, defined as science, practice, and movement, which I would say agroecology is unique in terms of incorporating all three of those things. Uh, and in fact, many people would say you're not really doing agroecology if you're not doing all three together. And just uh, to wrap up, or start to wrap up, in my one and a half minutes left, um, one of the things that is really interesting about some of the attempts to co-opt it is the attempt to use uh, science as sort of a bludgeon against it and say, well, the science part is good, but this movement stuff is that's, you know, silly or wrong-headed or biased. And it's kind of weird to me because if you admit that we need change, then by definition you need movement. That's how change happens. <laughs> And so large-scale change happens when there is some kind of social investment, especially movements or activism. Even the Green Revolution, it resulted from huge public investment, not that that was a result of a movement, but that was money that was coming from uh, many first world nations that should have been governed by the, the public purse and indeed was in terms of people not paying attention or tacitly or explicitly pr promoting it. And of course, the Green Revolution was a response to the Red Revolution, to movements and agitation in other countries wanted to stop communism from growing by trying to replace it with basically a higher productivity and driving certain farmers out of business. So if we just look around the world, I mean, when we see improvements in the things we care about, you pretty much always see movements. And all of us care about food and agriculture to some extent, so we're going to need movements. That's just how it works. Uh, and agriculture really seeks to embrace that and do this change together. Uh, so my own research uh, has focused on Brazil. My book called Beginning to End Hunger looked at Brazil's social policies and food over the past two decades. And they've made quite a lot of advancements, even though right now there's a lot of problems. But to, say, to put it lightly, um, but one of the things that I observed, I think is really important to remember, is that you had movements working with uh, what was then a nascent political party, the Workers' Party. And when you had people working together like that, when you had scholars working together with the movements, this was during a dictatorship. When a scholar was your ally, that meant they were putting themselves at risk of jail, of, of being uh, uh, exiled, of a lot of really nasty stuff. And so it was really seriously showing up for movements in a way that I think we need to think about how we do that now, beyond just uh, saying the right things or buying the right things. How do we show up for those who are in the trenches who are doing this work? How do we push and join movements rather than necessarily doing our own thing? We need to figure out how to also do things for and with others, like the peasant farmers of the world. Uh, and so uh, just two quotes to end it with Frederick Douglass saying those who favor freedom and yet deprecate agita uh, agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground or maybe other uh, low to alternatives. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. 
Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. We need to work together, but at the same time, we have to work together from solidarity, not from top down. Uh, because if you come here to help me, you're wasting our time. But if you come because our liberation is, your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thank you. Good evening. How many people here know what La Via Campesina is? Raise your hand, please, if you know. Okay, that's, what, <laughs> that's more than half, that's great. So uh, both Clara and Jahi talked about how social movements are the key to agroecology becoming a dominant paradigm. They're a key to transforming the food system and they're a key to transforming the world in general. And, and as Jahi and Clara pointed out, there haven't been many major positive changes in the history of humanity without social movements pushing for them. So I'm going to talk about uh, agroecology with regard to the world's largest secular social movement. Next. Oh, I control it here. Uh, La Via Campesina is the global movement of national organizations of small farmers, peasants, indigenous people, farm workers, uh, landless people, rural youth, rural women in 80 countries in the world. Uh, after Christianity and Islam, it's the, and it's the largest human social movement on, on planet Earth, so I say it's so therefore the largest non-religious social movement, and it's rural people coming together to defend rural life, both human life and uh, the life of Mother Earth and nature. So uh, as both of the previous speakers I think have alluded to, peasant and family farm-based agroecology has a lot of advantages to what they've been calling the Green Revolution or industrial agriculture, whether it's healthy food, rural livelihoods, resilience, uh, less effect on climate change, uh, less indebtedness for farmers, better stewardship of our productive resources, and greater autonomy and less external dependence for farmers. And these are some of the reasons why the world's largest social movement has made agroecology one of the central elements in its strategy for uh, transforming the reality in which rural people live and all, themselves, and then also uh, becoming uh, better allies for urban people in terms of producing healthier food. And of course, agroecology, as both of the previous speakers said, does come from traditional farmer knowledge. But we have, as Clara said, this remaining challenge of how to bring agroecology to a larger scale. Now, I don't mean taking a small farm and turning it into a big agribusiness farm. I mean that, that instead of a few small family or peasant farms, we would have many small family and peasant farms, such as practiced by ever more families over ever larger territories. And as Clara said, that requires a social movement for scaling up and scaling out agroecology. And in the case of Via Campesina, probably 95% um, of the small farmer organizations around the world and indigenous people's organizations have agroecology as one of their central strategies and are trying to work to do this process of scaling it up, uh, very often through processes of horizontal farmer to farmer, or, or as Clara said, campesino to campesino exchange in territories and through uh, many, many peasant agroecology schools that peasant organizations themselves are creating where peasants teach peasants about agroecological solutions. And I'm just going to do a quick tour around the world of La Via Campesina. So we have the Korean Women Peasants Association in South Korea. They are using their organizational fabric as a national movement of peasant women to try to stop a process that many people consider or have considered in the past to be unstoppable or inevitable, which is called genetic erosion or the loss of our traditional or heirloom varieties of important crops as they're replaced by, by a small number of highly homogenized commercial seeds made by, 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 uh, sold by global uh, seed corporations. 
And this, in the case of Korea, for those of you who know Korean cuisine, which I'm sure is, are, are many of you, depends a lot on vegetables. And peasant women in South Korea were starting to find it impossible to find seeds for the traditional heirloom varieties of vegetables that they consider to be very important for their food preparation. Uh, because the seed markets had been taken over by seed companies with their narrow range of varieties. So they decided that they themselves would stop and reverse this, this process of the loss of local varieties with a national movement inside a national women's peasant organization, which is that every woman peasant will adopt a seed. Adopt a seed means each woman chooses one variety, one heirloom variety of vegetables that is important to her, but for which there are no longer seeds available, either by exchange or by purchasing. And she makes a commitment with her family, her neighbors, her community, and her national organization that every year she will plant enough of that variety so that she can, in addition to having the produce and selling the produce, can save seeds not just for her own use, but also for an elaborate system of exchange through the National Women's Peasant Organization. So that's an example of how movement, as both Clara and, ja and Jahi said, can uh, be very powerful. Just the fact that we're a lot of people and we're organized, we can, re we can reverse by working together these processes. Uh, another case in Via Campesina is the zero budget natural farming movement in India. Uh, they call, they're calling, what we call agroecology, they're calling uh, natural farming a nod to Fukuoka, who uh, Jahi mentioned. And by zero budget, they're referring to a tremendous and horrible farm crisis that's been going on for about 30 years in India of farmers losing their land because they become so indebted to the banks because of the high, the high cost of green revolution technology, the high cost of buying chemicals, of buying commercial seeds, of buying machinery, leading to a national epidemic of farmer suicides. By the way, we also had several national epidemics of <clears throat> farmer suicides due, due, to, due to indebtedness in the United States as well, but in this case, in India, and this movement then rediscovering natural farming, agroecological practices as a way of not buying anything from outside the farm anymore, not becoming indebted, not needing to borrow money from banks anymore. And so this is probably the largest agroecology movement in the world. Uh, any, somewhere between 3 and 30 million peasant farmers over the last 15 years have changed the way they're doing their farming, depending on how you count it, in India. And through Via Campesina, we've organized many horizontal exchanges with peasant farmers from other countries in Asia. And this movement is now spreading uh, to Sri Lanka, to Nepal, to Indonesia and to some other places as a result of these exchanges. So one of the main things that Via Campesina does are farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchanges. Uh, in our member organization in Zimbabwe, we have a wonderful example of how taking land back from large fa farmers who illegally acquired it or their ancestors did it through land theft and giving back to uh, now landless farmers, in the case of Zimbab Zimbabwe, about 97% of the land belonged to white colonist farmers and the vast majority of, uh, of black farmers were landless. Uh, as a result of social movement pressure, the Zimbabwean government was forced to do one of the biggest land reforms in the world about 20 years ago. As a result of that, the, uh, Western Europe and the United States imposed economic sanctions on Zimbabwe so that, like in the case of Cuba, they couldn't import pesticides and things like that anymore. And they're another very successful example now of small farmers who now have land in their hands again, making it productive through agroecology as opposed to chemical or industrial farming. Clara mentioned Cuba, which is one of the, which together with the India case is the, is the other largest example of peasant agroecology on a, on a nearly national scale that we have in Via Campesina and in the world. In the case of India, it's the largest movement numerically. In the case of Cuba, it's the largest movement proportionally because in Cuba, it's about 50 to 60 percent now of the national farmer population have gone through the agroecological transition or transformation through these kind of horizontal farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchanges that are systematically organized by the National Peasant Farmers Union, which is a member of Via Campesina, and which is now serving, as Clara said, as an inspiration 
through Via Campesina organizing the international exchanges. So here it's peasant to peasant in a ter territorial level, then through Via Campesina it's peasant organization to peasant organization, learning how to replicate the process part. One thing is to replicate the actual practices, but a particular compost or, or intercropping strategy that works in Cuba may not work in Brazil or Ecuador or India, but the notion of creating a systematic process by which farmers exchange their innovations and experiences is much more replicable, replicable and uh, any kind of campesino, campesino, or farmer to farmer strategy starts by identifying those farm fam farmer families in the territory who are already successfully practicing agroecology and transforming them into the wise people who other farmers and peasants visit to learn from. Uh, in Via Campesina we've been creating uh, peasant agroecology schools, as I said, where peasants uh, teach peasants. About, uh, so it's like a farmer-to-farmer -farmer process in a territory, but in, a, in the case of a school in a concentrated space, but where it's farmers teaching farmers or peasants teaching peasants. We in Via Campesina have created this at the level of peasant universities, but also uh, other kinds of schools that, don't, that are not actually at the university level. But the peasant universities address two things. One, the need to train people in, in uh, peasants, to be trained by other peasants in agroecology, but also give access to a university education to the sons and daughters of peasants and indigenous people who historically have been excluded from the educational system. So these are universities created by peasant social movements to train the youth, the sons and daughters, to be both specialists in agroecology and in constructing these farmer-to-farmer -farmer processes, but also to get political and organizational training so that they will be the, 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 the next generation of leadership for the peasant movement. I'm just going to pass through, I only have a few more minutes, a slideshow of some of these peasant schools and universities. Our first one was the Paulo Freire School in Venezuela, and that was our first graduating class. We have, uh, for the whole region of the, the Andean region, we have the IALA. The IALA means Latin American Institute for Agroecology, and this is what we're calling all of our peasant agroecology universities. So we have one in Colombia. Clara participated in the inauguration of that, and it's, it's doing really well in Viota, Colombia. We have the Latin American Agroecology School in Paraná, Brazil, which has uh, sons and daughters from peasant organizations in all of what are called the Southern Cone countries in South America, as well as some people from the Andean region and, and Caribbean. We have uh, a peasant university for the whole Amazon region. It's in Marabá, Brazil, but it serves sons and daughters of peasant movements from the other countries in the Amazon region. We have the Guarani Peasant University in Paraguay. The Guarani linguistic group are indigenous people who are also in several countries in South America. So the Guarani Yala is for this kind of training for, the, for people from the Guarani region, from Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, Paraguay. We have the Yala for women, uh, for women peasants, women's leadership within the peasant agroecology uh, movement in Chile. We have, uh, this, is, this is also from the Chile experience, and not just Latin America, here's a, a Peasant Agroecology School of Via Campesina in Indonesia, a Peasant School for Agroecology and the Zero Budget Natural Farming in India, uh, the Peasant Center in, of our Via Campesina member in Quebec, Canada. They were inspired by a, a Via Campesina exchange to Cuba to create a farmer-to-farmer -farmer or paysan-to-paysan -paysan, uh, agroecology process in Quebec. And all of these peasant schools and peasant universities share an emerging set of pedagogical principles and philosophy, which some of us are calling peasant movement pedagogy, which they're all based on education for social change, education for work and through work, learn by doing, by practical experience, education for cooperation, that means both cooperatives but also in general the idea that people in a community should cooperate and help each other, education with values of humanism, education that is both through and for rebelliousness, that means that our students go to marches, go to barricades, go to land occupations and they learn through that and they also are learning to organize that. 
and education for and from the countryside. It's not an urban education being imposed on people in the countryside that tells, like most tr formal conventional schools, tell farm kids that everything in the, in the rural area is bad and you should grow up and move to the city if you want to be modern. No, this is, this is education designed by rural people to inculcate rural values so that the next generation will want to stay in the countryside and not move to the city. So, so some more images of our schools in different countries, and we'll close with the, the, the Via Campesina slogan, globalize the struggle, globalize hope. The idea is that by making this struggle global and by uh, basing it on this movement principle that both Clara and, and Jahi talked about is how we, we gather the force together to make changes both at the level of if we're a peasant family, farm family or a small farm family in the US, transforming our own farm, but also transforming our community, our territory, and fighting for larger social change via Campesina, trying to unite with poor people in cities now is a key strategy. Also, on the basis of providing affordable, healthy food for our brothers and sisters in uh, poor neighborhoods around the world. So, globalize the struggle. Globalize the struggle. Thank you. So at this time, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions, maybe five, uh, five minutes, something along those lines. So um, thank you, Peter, Jahi, and Clara for your presentations. That was wonderful. Um, is anybody interested in asking them a question? perception is that um, most of the folks who leave the country in um, the uh, not yet overdeveloped world are leaving the, the rural areas because they can't survive there, they can't figure out how to survive there, not because they want to go to the city. Um, what's your take and can you talk about the numbers? We're going to take a few questions at a time. And when the, when, uh, the panelists um, begin to answer a question, if you could refer back to the one that you're answering, that would be helpful. Question on, uh, for Peter would be, how can people here in this room, but more broadly, of course, in the developed world, assist in the Via Campesina effort? Thank you all so much. My question is, what do you believe the agroecology movement or community, like where do you see that they can be intersecting with other movements more? Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, this question is for you. If you, since you're coming from Mexico, it's very important <laughs> that you let us know what's happening with the Istmo de Tehuantepec and with the Tren Maya, because I think people here should know what's going on there and maybe you can give us some feedback pertaining to that. Let's start with that and see where that takes us. So, uh, same order. So, uh, well, I guess we'll all take a quick shot at it. Um, why are people ru uh, leaving rural areas? Of course, a lot of people are leaving for objective reasons, as, as you suggest, that they can't afford the state. Um, they're being driven into bankruptcy by the dominant farm system and the way that farmers are strangled by by companies, agroecology is an important way to get out of that because it's it's this uh, the lack of profitability is because farmers are induced to buy all of this, these expensive seeds, chemicals, and machines that then they're selling their crops can't pay off that debt, and agroecology provides ways to to produce their crops and animals without buying those chemical seeds and machines. So it's so one of the important things it's it's a way to ch turn around the economics of farming so that those people who are leaving because of objective 
reasons don't have to, but there are also a lot of subjective reasons. And one of the, the, the big priority that Via Campesina is putting on schools is because really the conventional schools, whether we're talking about the Midwest and the United States or whether we're talking about Latin America, Asia, Africa, what rural kids are told is to, are taught or what they're learning implicitly is to be ashamed that they're peasants, ashamed that they're farmers, ashamed that they're indigenous people. And, and that they should aspire to, a, to being able to have a, a life in an urban setting. And that's a very subtle thing that interacts with the economic reality and drives even more people out. And so turning the education around and having an autonomously controlled education process by rural social movements is, is important, and it's a complement to agroecology changing the, the economics. So um, how, how to support Via Campesina? Uh, well, direct support like money is always welcome, and, and there's a way to click and donate on the website, which is viacampesina.org. But in a more general sense, I think that uh, urban people supporting uh, small farmer movements, buying at farmer's markets. In the United States, the members of Via Campesina are the National Family Farm Coalition, the Rural Coalition, the Border Farm Workers Union in Texas, the Florida Farm Workers Association, Líderes Campesinas here in California, and I may be forgetting right now, a few other new organizations with a bunch of them just joined, but all of them are anxious to have members, volunteers, supporters, allies, etc. And I think I'll leave the other questions. Well, I'll come back quickly to the Ismo de Tehuantepec and the, and the, the Mayan train. In Mexico, uh, where uh, have a new president, on the one hand has some positive sounding policies, but on the other hand, has some policies that are very frightening to peasants and indigenous people because it's to build mega development projects in rural areas that will displace them from their territory, sort of like the pipeline conflicts here in the United States. And one of them is a dry canal to basically supplement the Panama Canal with a huge highway railroad and port network that would cross Mexico from from the Caribbean to the Pacific, it's in the Ismo, the, the Tuantepec Isthmus, and it has huge opposition from rural people because it's going to affect thousands of communities and territories. And another is to build a tourist train all over the Mayan region. And the, the people might think, oh, more tourists in, in, the, in the Mayan region of Mexico would be good for the local economy, except that where tourists have arrived in the Mayan region so far, like Cancun and the Riviera Maya, what they've done is destroyed the local economy and turned local people into chambermaids and bartenders, and, and they've lost their land and their, their livelihoods. And so indigenous people in the Mayan region call those tourist developments a cancer that's going to metastasize with this Mayan train, and therefore they want to stop that from being built. So there's a lot of opposition in Mexico right now to what people are calling mega projects um, that would displace rural people from their territories. I, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think it helps us to explore a little bit more. And I wanted to, to say something about the first question, why people move to the, to, from the rural to urban areas. And I think uh, we need to understand what kind of policies affect the small farmers. Because, for example, globalization forced the farmers to move to the north or to move to the cities because they cannot compete with the policies that the United States or even Europe impose in our countries. This is, I think, one of the major reasons why we have so many immigrants here. Because people are questioning immigrants, but they don't know that the root causes of the problem uh, was born here because the policies, the free trade agreement, the globalization forced the many farmers, most of the people that are here were farmers in the countries, in their countries, in Mexico, in Central America, in Colombia, in Ecuador. Look what happened with all the people that are in, 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 in Spain, Equatorians, or uh, even Africans that are in Europe. And people are questioning why these people are coming here. I think we need to. And, and one uh, question that the, the second um, question is related to that. What you can do here to stop all these policies? And, and I think the answer is very simple. You need to vote for somebody that don't put the, don't impose the policies, the agricultural policies that are 
uh, ruin our agriculture. And I think it's very, very important to have information about that and support those people and not blame them because this society blame the, 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 the people that are coming here but don't understand that the root causes is from here. And I think this is very important in terms of agriculture. And the other thing, uh, despite the fact all the problems, we have so many examples. The example that I show in, in Colombia about the restoration ecology in Bellavista. Many people migrate to the urban areas because the political instability. In Colombia, we have paramilitaries, we have guerrilla, we have uh, delinquency. So many farmers, and also land grabbing, they, are, they have been forced to leave the land, and many people decide to stay in this community. Even that 10,000 people left the community, they decide to stay and demonstrate that they can live from the land. And I think many examples of that demonstrate the courage that many farmers have, and what they need is no money. They need support, and they need that you vote for somebody that really cares about Latin America. Again, a hard act to follow. Um, on the question on rural or urban migration, um, I think uh, Peter and Clara covered a lot of what I would say as well, but I think one thing that's important to remember is how urban is defined. Urban means greater than 10,000, or depending on this country, 20,000 uh, 20, citizens. So it's not all people going to mega cities where there's this land of opportunity, which of course itself is a myth, but even so, uh, a lot of these are still pretty small settlements and often still pretty dependent on uh, parts of the rural economy. So it's not, I think we need to think, be clear what urban means in those numbers. Um, and then, uh, as, as Peter pointed out, you know, it's not, uh, uh, there's various pressures. Uh, there's a, a famous phrase from Farshad Aragi uh, talking about deep ethanization, about farmers being pushed out of the uh, countryside, the invisible hand and the visible foot that they're very, they're programs that are very strongly pushing farmers out because of the view that they're inefficient, uh, because of the view that they might get too radical. Uh, and so there's a, a variety of things, depending on the country you're looking at, that pressure people out of the countryside, including the ideology of what we invest in um, internationally or, or nationally. And just, I had a graduate student who was working in Uganda, and he went to work on biological nitrogen fixation. So how do we you know, figure out a, a better way to get uh, nitrogen to plants? And the farmers he wouldn't be talked to said, what are your, your problems with your crops? And he thought they'd say, you know, nitrogen or, or fertilizer or something. And they said, can you get your farmers to stop undercutting our prices? <laughs> so these are the things that we need to look at. And of course, our farmers on median are not doing well either. In terms of farm income from farming, it's neg over negative $1,000 income for the median farmer in the United States. So all these farmers are undergoing pressures at different extents and types, but this common uh, challenge of Food being this one of the cheap things, and lives being a cheap thing. Uh, Raj Patel and Jason Moore had a book uh, not too long ago, uh, The History of the World and Seven Cheap Things, that we try not to pay the full cost, and this ends up putting costs on others. Uh, so in terms of also how to support uh, Via Campesina, I mean, uh, Peter named a lot of the allies here, as well as, uh, or members, rather, here in the United States, as well as, of course, uh, your cash. I think it's always important to emphasize. Um, there's also the North, North Atlantic Marine Alliance, um, uh, which is also a member. Uh, I think one thing that can be done as well in terms of supporting these kinds of organizations is if you're not already involved in something in your community, in the food system, get involved. If it's something that would be a logical member for Via Campesina, that's something you could work towards, or just being an ally who's showing up and paying attention to the issues that they're pushing out. Uh, one thing that I've commented several times is uh, we think about the urgency of the climate crisis of other uh, uh, issues, but I know very few climate scholars, or some, but very few climate scholars who've gone to Black Lives Matter marches. If you're not showing up for a literal life and death situation that's now, why would you think people would show up for a life and death situation that is coming, but is more abstract? We have to cross these boundaries. So I'd say you know, if you're already a member of something, then figure out how to cross that with another organization working on other issues and figure out how to raise your voice together and maybe bring food issues in after you've done some time, you know, listening and, and being present for that. Uh, yeah. Can I say something? I just wanted to add, because one of the questions we have in touch, and it's the question that the girl asked about other 
movements that can join the agroecological movement, right? And I think it's very important to realize that everybody has to eat three times a day, at least. So I think everybody can join, and there are other movements that need to be aware about the food system. They need to understand, even if they are art movements, they, are, they can be our allies. It could be uh, the public, uh, public health movements because we need to avoid problems. And I think through food, they can understand the struggle that farmers are facing. Uh, through art, as, as I said, people from the um, law or env environmentalists that are fighting because they wanted to, to maintain you know, natural forests or pristine areas, well, they need to understand that even when in the Amazon, when they have indigenous people are the ones who are keeping more biodiversity than pristine areas. So I think it's a matter of information because you can continue with your cause, but at the same time to understand that the problem is global and that our, the problem is um, if we are not together, it will be very difficult to fight against a few corporations that are taking control of our food system. And I think um, it's not just if you are right, you are from the right or from the left. And I think now the question is, what kind of side do you, do you want? Pro-life or no life? And I think once you understand what kind of system is pro-life, you are going to choose the agroecological movement rather than the industrial movement. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to close. Um, thank you very much, Jahi, uh, Peter, and Clara for your wisdom. Thank you. And uh, they'll be around, I'm sure, to chat with anybody who has any other remaining questions. Thanks very much.